Hello, everybody. Welcome to our special event today, Remembering Roma Enslavement, organized by Archer, American Romanian Coalition for Human and Human Rights in collaboration with ARCS. Project American Romanian um, Cultural Society, represented today um, here by Otilia Baraboy, the director. Um, I'm Mihaela Campion from Archer, and um, I'm joined today by Andrea Motram from Archer as well, my friend and colleague. And the three of us, Otilia, Andrea, and myself, are going to uh, moderate the conversation around this important topic that we are going to discuss today. Um, our guest speakers are absolutely incredible. Their bios are remarkable. Uh, and I will not have enough words to present everything that is in their bio. So therefore, I'm going to choose what I believe is the most significant in their achievements um, and the rest of it, you can find out more in uh, the bios that Andrea are going to post and also in the event post on Facebook where you can check their, um, their achievements in the discussion section. Uh, I'm going to start with Alina uh, because we just watched the documentary that she directed, Letter of Forgiveness. And um, Alina is, um, I mean, her representation is absolutely amazing. Uh, she is the director of this short documentary, also an actress and a playwright, uh, the winner of the Best Actress Award at the German Actors Guild Awards 2020 uh, for her leading role in Gypsy Queen. And in case you haven't seen that movie, I highly recommend it. It's absolutely incredible. Um, she's also a nominee for Best Actress of the German Film Awards 2020 and the representative of Romania in the Cannes International Film Festival 2018 for her, <clears throat> excuse me, for her leading role in Alone at My Wedding. Alina is the first one in her family to graduate high school. Um, but she didn't stop. She's unstoppable, if you can all know probably by now. Um, she succeeded to graduate from Tisch School of the Arts in New York uh, and obtained a Master's of Arts. <clears throat> um, she obtained also a Master's from Royal Academy of Dramatic Art in London, becoming an award-winning actress and the first drama, theater, and film director of Romania. Congratulations, Alina, and thank you for joining us today. We feel really honored and grateful to have you here with us. Thank you very much. I'm also very honored to be with you, even though we're not physically close, I'm very, very honored to, to be in your presence. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, we are connected, you know, heart to heart and soul to soul. <laughs> exactly. Um, next, um, remarkable guest speaker of today uh, is Dr. Mario Sturda, professor in Central and Eastern European uh, biomedicine at Oxford Brookes University, UK. Um, she, he's originally from Maramures in Romania, and um, he has been teaching at Oxford for many years. Um, he is also the author of numerous, um, um, numerous uh, books and publications and articles. Uh, he is also the founder and director of the Cantemir Institute at the University of Oxford and founder of the working group of the history of eugenics and race established in 2006. He is a, he is a member of Academia Europea, fellow of the Royal Historical Society and fellow of the Galton Institute. Welcome, Marius. Thank you for being here with us today. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Uh, I'm sorry to disappoint those of you who probably wanted to have Marius Stan 
uh, instead of Marius Turda. But, you know, uh, hopefully it wouldn't be too bad a choice to have me amongst you. It's a truly an honor and it's, I'm very, very pleased to meet you, Alina, and to see Mark and Adrian again. Yeah, and I have to apologize that you know you know the custom in Romania when you bat you when you baptize someone, and I have to offer you a gift as well. So it's going to come in the mail. <laughs> yeah, um, <clears throat> Ma Dr. Margareta Magda, I love to say Magda. It's it's closer to me. Uh, Matake is um, our guest speaker today, honored guest speaker. She's a justice activist and scholar from Romania, director of the AFXB Center for Health and Human Rights, Roma program, and a Harvard instructor. Uh, author of numerous publications, um, an activist. Um, she is like, what, what else you can say about her activism and academic achievements. Um, thank you, Magda, for joining us today. I'm really excited to have you here and um, thank you for accepting our invitation and helping me to organize this. I have to recognize you were the, the engine of this for a long time already. Um, thank you so much, Mihaela, for organizing the event. It's such a great pleasure to be here today and uh, to, you know, to have this conversation with Alina, Marius, Adrian, and such a great pleasure to also see Otilia and Andrea in the conversation. I look forward to discussing with you. Thank you. Um, and last but not least is um, Adrian Nicolae Fortuna from Bucharest. So happy to have Bucharest represented here by you and Alina today. Um, <clears throat> Adrian is the, uh, graduated from the Faculty of Sociology of the University of Bucharest, and he holds a master's degree in advanced sociological research. And currently he is um, enrolled as a PhD student at the Quality of Life Research Institute, specializing in the field of the social memory of Roma slavery. Um, 15 years of intense activity, publishing research papers, and also working on a book, as far as I remember. Um, welcome, Adrian. Thank you for being here with us today. We really appreciate your presence, and we are looking forward for a very interesting, needed, and urgent conversation with all of you today. Thank you very um, much for the invitation. I would like to ask Otilia to start um, on a continuum because we just watched the movie and it's so powerful and it's so, I don't know, it's really like, you know, my, uh, my heart is beating a little bit faster uh, from watching it second time. Uh, so, Otilia, uh, if you have any comments or questions for Alina, I, I would love to invite you to, to start the conversation. Yes, <clears throat> thank you, um, everyone. Thank you, Alina. I'm so glad that we get the chance to uh, continue our, our conversation that we started at the Romanian Film Festival in November. And I was telling everyone, I don't know if you heard that actually this film, Letter of Forgiveness and Gypsy Queen were the mostly viewed films at the film festival, actually. So just to tell you how successful um, this short was, um, it's really amazing that you're also the director and you play the main part as well. And I just wanted, uh, I didn't get the chance to ask you that, but can you tell us now, how did you find the story? Because I know there's mm. a story behind it and what in history does it represent exactly because it's an important moment um behind the, um, the history that yes. we know yeah uh, thank you very much i will just want to say before i answer the question that even i watching it today i feel it's incredible i incredible for me to believe that i managed to pull it through I'm not, uh, I'm not speaking about the, the quality of, uh, the, that's for the public to decide. But for me as the insider, I just have to mention how impossible was this to be made, to be, I also, uh, I'm the producer of this film. 
and uh, it has been really impossible to to achieve this and uh, it's it's like a, i feel i feel as if inside of me it's like a small girl looking at it and and still being mesmerized by the fact that it exists now it exists and it's in the world and people from all over the world can see it and i'm very very honored to to receive uh to to connect heart by heart with other people that are receiving it i'm very honored and thank you so much and still mem- mesmerized that we pull it through <laughs> me and the, the whole team um this dream of uh, making it a feature has started by me uh documenting the roma slavery for a theater play so back by uh back then i was uh, um researching um, Roma historians' books like uh, the one that uh, Petre Percut uh, wrote. Um, and I was documenting myself, uh, documenting um, Roma slavery. And at one point, uh, I, um, I found this uh, in a memoir of uh, Sion. And um, there was there very much, obviously, was from his personal uh, experience, uh, um, about more about his life and that at one point he met Maria that was the mother of this boy uh, who, who, who whose death has brought sooner the abolition of Roma slavery and that was an interesting point for me to uh, to start um, a story so uh, I took I read that and then I made it my own I wanted to to uh, to pull its uh, corners uh, closer to my heart, closer to my experience, so that so that this is from a Roma point of view, as um, as if that Roma could speak now and tell us what he or she felt in that moment. Um, obviously, it's it's also fictionalized because. Um, yeah, it's 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 part of a real story that is also fictionalized, and um, I work together with uh, Luisa Medellano who, uh, from Roma Education Fund. That I'm I saw her as well in the conversation now. Hi, Luisa. And uh, at one point, it was very hard to um, separate myself from the fiction and and from reality because at one point I was very very stressed by all that. Um, the historical was bringing. For example, we were on the set and I was very nervous that, oh my God, how would you greet uh, um, a dicta- uh, sorry, um, a ruler coming in the house? What would be the custom? What would they eat? What would, so all, this, all these details at one point were very, very stressful for me. And then at one point I had to relax and say, okay, I need to tell a story first and then to add the um, all the historical uh, elements to it but but to focus on the storytelling because at one point even uh, how to uh, show a washroom where the two characters go and I cleaned uh, that uh, uh, stain on the dress that was a, a huge stress for me because everybody from the team were also stressed <laughs> because how how a, how a washroom from uh, 1857 would look like. <laughs> they were very, the carpet, the, the paintings, everybody was very, very stressed. Uh, so I tried, I said to them that we should all try our best to tell this story, but mainly focus on the storytelling and less on the, uh, the 100% accuracy of historical uh, details like this so uh, to answer and to finish answering your question uh, this is uh, dated um, around clo- closer to the abolition uh, of the slavery closer to 1850 something 56 57 around that point uh, this would be a very small slice from a bigger story where we we would find out about dinka's life about maria's life more and at this point in the in the story, um, I'm not sure if I give a spoiler alert, but he 
he will commit um, suicide and um, he uh, and then his death would bring um, the ruler and and um, the the owner to uh, make everybody ab um, abolish slavery sooner sorry for the spoiler alert but uh, hopefully you will forget this information by the time I will have the all the resources to make a feature film. Um, thank you uh, so much, Alina. And uh, we do have a question from the audience, actually, in the chat. Uh, I'm curious how it was documented. I read the version of the science book and I'm eager to learn more. Were you able to trace the street and the house where this happened? Um, the, the street, um, the, the house, for example, it exists. It was called um, um, Palatu Canta Cuzinilor, the, the palace, the Canta Cuzino Palace, uh, and then changed to uh, Palatu Copilor, the children's palace. Um, and um, it still exists as a, as a building. Uh, but to be honest with you, I do not know with the exact street uh, by name. Yeah. And it was an idea for us to even go there to, um, to film it there. But production wise, it was a bit more difficult. So we sticked with something closer to Bucharest. Thank you. <laughs> And I, I will. I have other questions, but I think we should go on with the other guests because there's so many other interesting sure. things to talk about. Come back for sure. Yes. Part of the of the theme of today. Um, well, the event is um, organized um, because Roma had been enslaved for five centuries in Valachia and Moldova. Um, and um, we celebrate today the freedom which came 165 years ago. Uh, and at the same time, the public recognition of the loss of the um, suffering and trauma, I would say, it's still not fully recognized and acknowledged. Um, so I would like, in order to give us a bigger picture of the historical um, events, I would like to ask Adrian if he can, um, if you can help us understand a little bit more about the slavery, uh, about what happened uh, back then and what's, you know, what, what was the situation? How, why do we call it slavery? And maybe if you can touch a little bit on the fact that for so many years, we haven't been taught, we haven't been aware of the true history of Roma suffering in Romania. Thank you. I will try uh, very shortly to um, speak a little bit about the origins of Roma slavery in the Romanian principalities. So I'm, um, I must say that uh, Viorela Kim, that is a very known historian in uh, Romania, he says uh, that the origins of the slavery in the principalities until now have uh, not formed the basis of an uh, independent uh, study in the Romanian historiography. So the answer until now is that uh, we don't truly know until now the origins of the Roma slavery. Uh, we have only some uh, theories regarding the, the fact how the Roma were uh, enslaved in the Romanian territory. Uh, the most known uh, theory on this regard is uh, the theory of Nicolae Iorga, that he's saying that uh, the Roma were uh, uh, enslaved uh, 
together with uh, they were slaves of the Tatars, and after that they uh, also became the the slaves of the of the Romanian. Other writers uh, explain the appearance of the slavery in the Romanian territories uh, with the reference to the Romanian battles with the Tatars. As a result of these battles, the Roma captured from the Tatars were transformed into slaves. Uh, but this, like this, like uh, I said, are only uh, theories on on regard on how we were enslaved here. Another important, very another uh, important historian, Petre Petkuts, uh, he's uh, launching the theory that uh, Roma uh, came from uh, from the uh, south of the Danube, like free people in a way, because uh, there are uh, some uh, sources that are saying that Roma in the uh, Byzantine Empire were uh, taxpayers, but it was also a, a status that was uh, uh, transferred to them when they uh, came in the Romanian principalities, because here the rulers also uh, transform them in slaves of the of the of the state they were paying taxes but after that he started to uh, make uh, donations to the monasteries and and to the boyars so in very big lines uh, I would say that uh, this is the 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 way in in which the Roma became uh, uh, slaves in the Romanian territory. But I think that is very important to share with you. If I don't know if I have five minutes more, I I want to share with you uh, some something that I consider is very important because it's a. Uh, uh, regards the, the legislation. And I think if I will just read uh, from the uh, Karaja law, uh, from example, from uh, uh, 18, uh, that there is a chapter regarding especially the, the this population of the Roma slaves. So, uh, in the Karaja law uh, says that all the slaves are somebody's property. This is the status of the gypsy in Valachia. The second article says, says that all people born from slaves shall remain slaves. Article three, all born from a slave mother shall be slaves. Also the case of Dinka. Uh, a gypsy, a gypsy's master has no power over his life. This it was, you know, the jure, but in fact, uh, a gypsy's master is free to sell or donate him. All gypsies in Valachia who cannot prove who their master is belong to the royal court. Uh, also, there are some articles uh, regarding the, the fact that if, if a particular person uh, had in her possession a slave without papers, and without, uh, if the state will ask for that person, the, the the person that enslaved that uh, that person should pay some uh, some uh, reparatory I, I would say uh, so here uh, in function by with the state of the person with the skills of, of the person um, that uh, the the owner should uh, should uh, give some uh, reparations and uh, also, there are uh, mentions regarding the 
the uh, for example that gypsy who would marry a free woman or the free man who would marry a gypsy woman without the knowledge of their masters shall be separated however if their master allow them to get married then they shall remain together as free people and their master shall be impaired so what i want to say is that the slavery had in the romanian principalities a legislation in the 19th century the legislation regarding the the roma slaves uh, I, I would say that it, it, it was very rich so the 19th uh, uh, century gives us a, a, a very um, important overview on the situations on the situation of the roma slaves i wanted to to show that uh, by law the roma population it was enslaved and uh, there were a few cases indeed there were roma that were free but there were some special cases like the 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 law says all the roma from the the romanian territory was enslaved and uh, they were uh, their uh, force of labor was used for centuries uh, in the in the romanian principalities by the monasteries by the boyars and by the state i don't know if i have if I have more time, I think. <laughs> uh, also, I'm, also. Sure, I'm sure you have a lot to say, and it's it's so important to learn. Um, yes, if it's something that you want to add, feel free. We, we don't want Thank to you. short. Thank you. Uh, I want to to add, for example, to in order to to give the 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 floor to. Uh, Magda and Marius, uh, that there were um, laws uh, that were saying that in in the case that a daughter of a boyar had uh, sexual relations with a slave, with a gypsy, with a Roma slave, they must be killed. So. It was, it was uh, like Petre Petkuts uh, says in his book, it was a law inspired from the uh, Old Testament, from the Bible, mm -hmm. yes. Uh, and uh, it, uh, it shows that the, the Roma were, de facto, they were considered uh, on the same level with the uh, animals because it, it was something like zoophilia so uh, the if also if we look to the to the legislation uh, regarding uh, the the centuries immediately after uh, the first uh, attestation of the roma in the romanian territory they are inspired morally uh, uh, from the from the church, and uh, it is very interesting to see that the Roma were considered uh, uh, pagans, and special laws were given to uh, baptize them, to in the sense to make uh, uh, them the, to become like uh, human uh, beings. Uh, in the 18th century in Moldova, it is uh, given a, a law that was uh, uh, to forbid the separation of the children for, uh, from their families. And the, the document says that uh, we uh, separated the, the children uh, from their families until now, but from this moment, we will uh, stop it because also the gypsies, they are uh, uh, created by God. So it was during the slavery, it was a, a, a very 
important uh, discussion on the on the the way that that Roma, if they were considered or not uh, uh, human uh, human beings, and I will stop here because uh, Magda, I, I think I she will say more. Thank you. Um. Marius, would you like to add anything or we can move to the next question? Well, I see Magda has returned, so I would rather that she continued with the presentation and talk and then I'll come in. Okay, great. Um, yeah, it's so, it's so powerful to learn about things that we didn't have a chance to learn when, we're, when we were studying in Romania. At least I can speak for myself. You know, many of these things were not taught in schools um, and it's a, it's a common loss. Uh, I mean, I feel, I feel like it, it's my loss of not knowing the, the history of my own country. Um, but moving on, uh, I would like to ask, um, to ask you, Magda, why do we argue that Roma enslavement, it's a racial enslavement? It's a, it's a big argument. And um, I know there are so many who uh, detach from the idea. Uh, and, um, you know, it's, it's really important in this time in history to take ownership of it. And I would like you to explain to us to help us understand why um, yes. the racial so, enslavement. So first of all, uh, good morning again, and thank you so much for the invitation. Please allow me to take a moment and really congratulate Alina Sherban for a this spectacular film, but also for her entire work throughout her uh, ca career, because this is not the only film that looks at the Roma history in her work. She also uh, produced and directed a play that is called The Great Shame. Uh, you may, I think, watch it online, but again, the play looks at the history of Roma enslavement, and I think it's important for us Romanians, Roma, and European citizens and global citizens to, to actually understand this piece of history through the lens of arts. And I, I do want to, to, to put emphasis on how important her work is. And then also to congratulate uh, Adrian Fortuna, we call him Nico in Romania, for his archival work. Because I think that there has been uh, quite a bit of history written in Romania, but what Adrian and others are doing nowadays is really to bring more ar archives in the conversation. And that's so, so uh, essential in discussing Roma enslavement. So I want to give you both uh, th th that moment and say how grateful I am for, for your work. But uh, indeed, I think to, to make an argument that Roma enslavement is racial enslavement, it's a, a bold step that I take and some others join this, this conversation as well. But to me, I think it is uh, important um, that when we conceptualize, understand and address the legacy of Roma enslavement, we need to also think about it as a form of racial enslavement. And that is relevant both at the national and the global levels. But also I think uh, it's relevant uh, for the purpose of theories, uh, including global theories, and for the purpose of practice and how we address the legacy of enslavement. And Adrian talked about the origins of Roma enslavement and he mentioned uh, that although we have more clarity in what regards the sources of slavery, there are various competing theories regarding the, um, the origins of Roma enslavement. But in discussing these theories, I suggest that is fundamental to answer a question which is similar to the question that Winthrop Jordan asks in uh, The White Man's Burden. And that question is why Africans specifically came to be slaves in the first place. And what he suggests in asking that, that question is that pre-existing racial and religious stereotypes about Africans offered Europeans this moral justification, if you want, to be able to, to sit on the deck of the ship as, uh, as Jordan would, would put it. 
And thus, to me, in the context of Roma enslavement, the question is why only Roma specifically, especially after 1400s, if we are to you know, take back the Tatars' uh, experience, remained enslaved for 500 years in the Romanian principalities. Is it really a coincidence that Romanians seized a new people, newcomers who were non-white and non-Christians? If power and a political uh, project targeted the people newly arrived in a given territories for those reasons, then I think uh, the question is really why aren't we talking about racism or at least proto-racism if we were to use a, a term that Benjamin Isaac coined to, to, to refer to experiences uh, of um, racism before the, the birth of uh, the, the concept of race and uh, the theories of races uh, of races and um, I believe that when discussing the history of anti-Roma racism we have to start with this political project because in, the enslavement was a political project which was justified through what we could call today cultural and race prejudice and in that sense uh, we have to understand anti-Roma racism not in the way in which dominant majorities view Roma as gypsies. And I think this is the argument that helps some people to, to say, to, to coin the term anti-gypsism. So I don't believe that prejudice was the, the, uh, the driving force of, uh, of racism, but I think it's, it's important for us to understand and to unpack racism as a political project if we were to use the, the concept of, uh, that Francisco Betancourt puts uh, in, in the conversation. And uh, we, we have to think about uh, a syst a racism, anti-Roma racism as a system of domination and, uh, and oppression, which was justified through to race and cultural prejudice uh, and it, it involved power. So I think that when discussing racism, it's impossible to take the concept and the practice of power out of the conversation. Um, and that leads me, and I'll talk only for a little bit more about this, to, to the, um, to the um, global dimension of understanding enslavement as racial, uh, Roma enslavement as racial enslavement, because Roma do not really have a place in the history of, uh, of race and racism at the global level. Um, uh, and we also know that there are various theories uh, regarding the origins of race, if we are to understand race as, uh, as descent. Um, so in Europe, many historians, and I would like to hear Marius's uh, uh, points here, I, I read his book, but I would say that in, in Europe, many historians, but not only, they place the origins of, of, um, of racism or, or race in the birth of the theories of races. And yet when we think about the theories of races we, and place the, the origins of race there, we kind of cancel and neglect the reality of racial slavery, which was gradually justified through racist claims about the uh, kidnapped and enslaved uh, people, the Africans shipped to the colonies, but also about the seized and enslaved people, the Roma. What experiences we have to say that they preceded the 18th and the 19th century and the theories of races. Does I, I argue that the invention of race as a practice happened before the invention of the theories of races. Uh, and I joined the, you know, the school of thoughts of other, uh, other scholars to, who say that. And I think that uh, it, you know, the, the invention of race as a practice in the case of Roma happened before seizing Roma as an enslaved people. And it's also interesting and though very upsetting for me to see that authors like Francisco Betancourt who agreed that racism started before the theories of races. Uh, and in fact, he argues that racism started in the 12th, 13th century with the uh, oppression of the Jewish and uh, Muslim people in the Iberian uh, region. But he says that in this context, Roma were an exception. And he argues that the, ty the type of, uh, of oppression that Roma faced was not racism, although it it was racism in the case of the other people. And it was not racism because the, the people, the Europeans were afraid of Roma. So it was basically uh, the persecution of a nomadic people 
who were persecuted because of their way of life. So it wasn't because of their race, but rather because of their way of life. And that's upsetting if you were to compare this argument also to the narrative about the Holocaust, when Roma are often forget, uh, forgotten and neglected, also because one of the narratives is that Roma were not exterminated because because of racial grounds, but because of their criminality. And if you were to think about criminality put together with the people, that's definitely racial um, uh, uh, racism and a racial segregation. So what, what I'm saying is that, first of all, there is no uh, uh, a way of life of Roma. Not all Roma were nomadics from the beginning of, uh, you know, of their um, uh, lives in uh, in Europe. I think that we we see encounters of uh, sedentary Roma in the 1300s in Bulgaria, but also in Greece in the 1400s. Uh, and plus, as uh, Adrian mentioned, both, uh, you know, the enslaved, the enslaved people were both and sedentary Roma. So there, there was some, uh, some variety there uh, as well. So the question really is what kind of way of life are we really talking about and how are, are we able to essentialize the Roma experience in such a racist way without being uh, uh, kept accountable for it? So to conclude, what I, I would say is that for me, it is essential to place Roma in such global conversations, but in an accurate and anti-racist way, and at the same time to consider a global perspective in understanding Roma and the different manifestations of anti-Roma racism across centuries and, and territories, including the, the experience of, of Roma enslavement. Thank you, Magda. Powerful points and arguments. Um, I heard you saying that you would like to hear Marius opinion on this. Okay. Um, well, firstly, I should like to say that I, I couldn't agree more with what Magda was saying in terms of uh, how we expand and integrate uh, the history of Roma slavery within debates about the global history of race before racism, global history of uh, power relations, uh, global history of coloniality. And if I'm not mistaken, I saw um, uh, Manuela Botka there, who's a specialist in this. So I think that's, a, that's the right direction to go forward. But um, I should like to add something to what Magda and Nico said in, in relation to what the topic of Roma slavery in a way um, represents for the Romanian majority, as it were. Um, to me, uh, the topic of uh, Roma slavery is like a knife that cuts at the heart of Romanian history. It remains, however, largely unknown to Romanians, as Magda pointed out. And as you, Mihaela, said, you did not study about Roma slavery in schools. Um, so the major historical narratives, which constitute the kernel of Romanian identity, do not include the Roma. So coming to terms with Roma slavery presupposes, in a way, um, a new uh, philosophical anthropology, a new social ontology, which accepts two basic principles. One, the idea of belonging. In other words, the Roma belonged to and of shared destinies. Uh, so they're not separate. They're not outside history. They're not uh, completely uh, 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 different people uh, throughout history. They are part of the same vortex of history that created what in 19th century became Romania. The first thing I should like to say, uh, I'll say three things. The first one is in a way to me how unproblematic, unproblematic slavery is construed in Romanian imagination and scholarship and public discourse. Nico already mentioned about the scholarship. So um, on the one hand, there is a very careful dancing around the concepts of slavery in Romanian uh, scholarship. Uh, some authors refuse to use the word slavery. Uh, uh, some authors refuse to accept that what happened for five centuries was actually not slavery, but another form of bondage that uh, quite conveniently can be called uh, in Romanian, there is another word that is often used, which is robie, uh, which is basically a form of servitude. 
Now, it's interesting if I can make a small hermeneutical footnote here, because of course, if those of you who are Romanians will know that, if, you, if you're Romanian Orthodox, the word robe, which means servant, is used throughout the entire religious uh, uh, experience of an Orthodox person. When you say, uh, I, the servant of God, Eu robul lui Dumnezeu, aici zace liniștit nicu. You could read this on a funeral cross. Uh, here uh, rests uh, God's servant Nico. So for the, popul for the general population, the word rob and robiem is in a way excised of its negativity. Because of course, if you say slavery and slaves, it's a completely different story. On the other hand, if you look at the high culture, Romanian high culture, elitist culture, there is a complete intellectual inertia behind any serious engagement with the history of slavery. Uh, and I do not mean here, of course, the, 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 the uh, extraordinary work being done by, Roma, by, by Roma scholars, but I mean the paragons, the luminaries of Romanian culture, which basically dictate the parameters of the conversation in Romania. So sorry, are... if, if I may add, sorry, Marius, I yes, just please, want to add um, a very uh, direct example of uh, me confronting this as an artist. Uh, before um, uh, Letter of Forgiveness, I wrote the play that uh, Magda mentioned, The Great Shame, and I, I got an email from the Ministry of Culture uh, actually censoring me, banning the word slavery from my press release, from my um, uh, poster. So um, according to the contract we had, they reminded me that I cannot use the word slavery. So they said uh, robie, the, the word that uh, Marius uh, uh, mentioned. So obviously I, I as an artist, being the first one re writing a, a play about this, not even starting to open the discussion and I was being told how, how to. Mm -hmm. So, oh, be careful. Let's not step uh, in, um, in fire now. Let's take it slow and uh, and not to mention how hard it was to take it to a to a public state theater mm -hmm. and how even now the play is not performed due to many interests of different people. So is in is indeed not a romantic topic, not a wanted topic, and um, even today, even with uh, a CV as mine. It's still very hard for me to to uh, open the discussion. So sorry for interrupting. Oh no, no, thank you. Indeed, I appreciate that because it confirms indeed what I was arguing for, that the high culture, the Romanian high culture, the way it's being conformed by uh, its traditions, of course, ignores entirely uh, not only the history of the Roma as not being a constitutive of normativity but also when the issue of uh, terminology appears, uh, they prefer strategically to use different terms. Uh, so five centuries of history uh, basically are completely, uh, you know, occluded in this way. Uh, but connected to this, there is another point, and I'm extremely pleased that we, we watched uh, a Letter of Forgiveness because this is, relates to my second point, which is about historical agency. Um, Roma are generally, portrayed when they are discussed uh, in the public discourse, in the scholarship by people as passive, as immobile objects, as people with no history, as unable of thinking with their own heads. In other words, uh, they were very, uh, they had very little awareness of their enslaved condition. Now we know that this is absolutely incorrect. Of course, it served the purpose of the Romanian national narrative, but it's incorrect historically. It's also incorrect humanly, because as you showed in your film, and we have historical documents about other case studies, particularly in the 19th century, Roma, Roma women in particular were very uh, actively involved in uh, liberating themselves. They, were, they were, didn't wait for someone to open the, the door to their cage. So that's another thing, is the, the discussion about historical agency, which is crucial in understanding, uh, again, what Magda had alluded to in terms of the power, 
in terms of how you portray uh, the racism of these uh, uh, situations is extremely relevant. Uh, and the third point I should like to make, if I, if I may, is about what can be called indeed uh, the civilizing mission of the Romanian nation state, uh, which after 1859, of course, attempted in a way to uh, dissolve the binary Roma Romanian. But they didn't attempt to dissolve it by uh, you know, a coherent program of cultural and social and political emancipation uh, of both Roma uh, men and women, but rather through neglect or in some cases through utter cynicism, you know, the cynical hope that, you know, just leave them alone, they will probably disappear. And if we're really, really lucky, they will actually leave. So um, that in itself is extremely important because it, it Nico uh, pointed out as well, you have this interplay between how they were portrayed before when they were slaves and how they were treated after the emancipation. And there is a very interesting uh, legacy there to be explored. Uh, so Magda pointed out very correctly, slavery obviously was the product of a legal system, of a racial worldview, of cultural structures, of social policies. And this all together did not only impoverish the Roma, but I would argue uh, they actually uh, constituted the edifice upon which modern Romania was built. And it's extremely difficult to come to terms with that legacy because you have to deep very carefully at uh, the foundation of your own house. Like I said at the beginning, this is like a knife that actually cuts through, you know, the fabric, the texture of the Romanian national identity, which is not as, um, you know, hard uh, as people think. It's rather much softer and hence in danger of being, you know, ripped apart. And people are literally uh, unwilling to take that courageous step forward and say, well, let's see what happens if we actually come and embrace this. Uh, so I'm reminded here, and I will finish with this, by what uh, 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 one of the authors um, I used to, to read as a, as a young man. Uh, his name is uh, Marcus Garvey, the famous uh, Pan-Africanist. And he says at some point, you know, um, a people without uh, the knowledge of their past, of their origin and of their culture is like a tree without roots. But I would argue, and I think this conversation today and the commemorations we have this week proves exactly the following point. You know, Roma are not a tree without roots. Their roots go deep into the Romanian lands. Their roots go deep into history. Thank you. Thank you. So beautifully said. And you know, this is a question when I was, um, starting to prepare this event um, along with my friends and colleagues from Archer and with Otilia as well and Magda. Um, one question that kind of lingered with me um, was how and why anti-Roma racism is still supported by good Romanian people. We are good people and yet something it's still there. And I don't have an answer for that question. And I don't expect any of you to give me that magic answer. But I'm posing this question just for an increased awareness, just for self-examination, for the work that we all need to do as humans in order to grow and to heal together uh, from this traumatic experience that affects everyone. Both ends are affected by this um, incredible um, traumatic experience, historical traumatic experience. And I really appreciate and I thank you all for having the courage to speak up and to make history known. So that's all I have to say from the bottom of my heart. <laughs> May I add one point here, Mihaela, uh, about this whole conversation about anti-Roma racism and how is it accept acceptable in, in Romania? And perhaps Alina can join this conversation because the two of us have uh, have talked about this quite quite a bit back home in Romania. But I think that when we talk about how accepted and acceptable anti-Roma racism is in Romania, as much as is in, across Europe, mm -hmm. uh, 
we, we do have to take into the consideration also the, the Roma side of this story. And as a Romanian myself, uh, I, I think it's, it's, it's complicated. People in Romania uh, ask me often, how do you feel uh, you know, about Romania? And I feel like, well, this is a very complicated relationship because on one hand, I'm Romanian. I'm a citizen of the country. I speak the language. I was educated in Romania. But at the same time, the country that I love doesn't really give me love back. So what it means for Roma people to be the citizens of, of a country and to love the soccer team, the national soccer team, to cry for, uh, for the tennis players, to be part of the machine, but at the same time to be constantly told that you're not part of, of, of that context and you're not good enough for that context that makes the the, uh, the things very complicated and I think we have to give Roma credit because we we, we talk about you know, oppression but we have to talk about resistance as well and love at the end of the day and the fact that Roma were enslaved for 500 years and these were moments when Roma mothers would raise the children of Romanian uh, uh, you know uh, parents and would make the houses you know be uh, be in order but at the same time how did Roma succeed to maintain this hope and love for the Romanian culture and the Romanian people knowing that they have been through these experiences of oppression and racism for for centuries so we do have to question that and I think that we do have to look at the humanity of our people back home um, and, and to question that when uh, incidents of anti-Roma racism happen, incidents of, uh, of violence, of police happen, we do have to speak up. And I think the least we could do as citizens is to, to, to raise those questions. But I, I do wonder how Alina feels about it. Uh... Anya? <laughs> yes. Um... Oh, uh, this is a very complex relationship um, because there are so many, as you know, good people, but uh, they have their trained racism. I have seen a lot of good people with good intentions that would not be able to question their privileges, their generational privileges that... Um, lead him or her to be where they are now. So it's, it's very, very complicated even for me when I tell my stories to make sure again and again, I, I come back to the humanity as, as, um, as Magda was saying, because we come back to the relationships today between us, Roma and Romanians. And um, I myself, I'm still developing that relationship. I swear, uh, some years ago, and I, be, I will be blunt, I had nights when I could not continue living in Romania. My mom would find me on the floor, really on the floor, crying my, my soul out on the carpet because I was in an event in a very uh, um, posh uh, so-called uh, magazine that was so-called anti-racist and they were doing this uh, crows versus um, pigeons performance and my stomach was out and no and everybody was applauding and it's hard to be the killing joy of many situations anyway it's hard to be a an artist that tells my stories because a at the beginning when I started, and thank you, Magda, and even in the activist Roma world, they would look at me as a weird creature, like, why would you say Roma stories? And why would you use theater and film to, to fight races? Because it was weird, you know? It was weird because uh, uh, the Roma activists were doing more like uh, campaigns, anti-racist with the flyers, all, different types of instruments. And uh, then the Romanians were seeing dances, exotic dances, uh, from time to time having Roma uh, being portrayed by non-Roma in a stereotypical way. So then 
I could not even like make space for my narrative for my story and even for living my truth because at one point you're you are asked to be someone else sometimes why are you not like the stereotype i've been hearing about because you're not hearing our stories because there are no stories out there that that would uh, describe our humanity our diverse humanity because obviously Romanians are so diverse. Obviously they are good, bad, ugly, fat, tall, short, la la la, gay, doesn't matter. Able, not able, handicapped, all, all that. But you don't see these stories about Roma people. You only see one story. So obviously we are, we are so far back. I have to say, we are so far back and then I don't even know how to behave sometimes when I am outside of the country. When I meet fellow Romanians, I have a guard up. I have to say, because I have been in a situation with other Romanian filmmakers representing Romania in Paris, and the Romanians really attacked me. I have to say, they attacked me for daring to say they're in our country it's a thing called racism. And they, they, they jumped on their feet and they attacked me verbally and said, uh, take, take that back. And they, had, they, they were in a cultural event, you understand? My heart was beating so much because I knew I had to behave uh, accordingly and be the nice one. So I would not reinforce stereotypes. So what I mean is that life is real and uh, life is in so many nuances. And um, I'm, we're still developing this relationship. I am uh, with a small spoon trying to, to get to that uh, humanity side that I'm, I'm still uh, uh, even myself trying to find. And I will, um, I will finish with, with something that I hear my mom saying, and sometimes it's painful for me. I, I like her saying this, but sometimes it's painful because she looks at the, at the TV and sees uh, Romanians uh, succeeding. And she says, uh, our Romanians. And it's painful then when she goes to the store and then she hears people saying very easily something about us being the gypsies being and not being the Romanians. So in this, in this relationship of, um, of reject. So there's obviously many, many levels of this. And even I as a person, how would I grow up in a country where I only hear bad things about myself? I have to say in, in, the, in the great shame at one point, I question Roma identity. And I have to say that in many times I would empathize with a, a, Roma, a Roma woman that maybe had, doesn't have anything from my background. Maybe she was rich and no, 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 I don't know. Yeah, with a Roma, I would empathize that, that she goes on the same street with me. I will empathize with her more than with a Romanian woman. Why? Because we share the same rejection. Even though she might be rich, as I said, uh, in, in a status way bigger than me. And it's painful for me to say, and I'm fearful of saying this in a academical way, let's say. I rather say that in my play. But I argue that even like rejection is so known to us and i would just leave it there with dot 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 <laughs> thank you for having me <laughs> I, do, it so is. I do have a question about collective amnesia that we seem to suffer mm. from as romanians together mm -hmm. And everything you say, Magda and Alina, about feeling not off, 
out of place. And I think many of us who left feel this way because we do not identify with this discourse of you are with us if you perpetuate these stereotypes about all the people who have been marginalized in our history. And I think the fact that Romanians do not see archival work and history as being a form of empowerment and greed of, of, of their victimhood, mm. you know, that they perpetuate from one generation to another, I think is, is really here we have to look at a collective, you know, the phenomenon from a collective point of view. And I do have a question from Adrian, how much, and for, for every one of you, how much of the history of, of Roma slavery is known to the Roma people themselves? Because I know that Romanians have many, you know, we all know that there's not much known about it and the refusal to know about it. Uh, thank you very much for the question. It's very interesting. So I will try to answer from two perspectives. Uh, first, it's my personal uh, perspective and why I'm saying this, because I remember that now, one year ago, in a discussion with my uh, parents and uh, speaking with, the, with them about my PhD thesis on the social memory of, Dorma, of Roma slavery, I started to give them historical information about, uh, about the slavery. So I started to show them uh, documents from this uh, collection of documents that we published. There are uh, documents with uh, a very a high level of uh, emotional impact because they are speaking about the uh, sellings of children and uh, et cetera. And after that, I started to read uh, them from a, from a book. It's uh, in Romanian, Păcatele Slugerului, and it's about, like Alina also said before, it's about the shame that the Roma suffered during the slave. And uh, my, my father, asked me, and do you think that it's, it's good for the Romanians and for the Roma to know this history? And here, here we have the, the I consider in a way the, the trauma because I started to heal this trauma, this cultural trauma on my field research. And I will uh, give you some, uh, examples. Uh, when I uh, found a church that was established for the Roma slaves, and when the priest uh, didn't refuse to, to speak in, in the front of the camera, but he wanted to, to tell the story of, in that moment, I was, I was feeling that my, my body was healing from, from this uh, uh, trauma. Maybe, uh, how to say, in Romania, this uh, discussion on cultural trauma, and it's, I mean, it's not so scientific, you know, considered by the uh, academia. Uh, but the, the impact of the fact that you don't know uh, your history and you are not able to understand your present situation because uh, also I, I consider that the historians, the sociologists and every uh, that worked on this, uh, on the Roma issues, they took very little in, uh, in, in consideration the, the slavery because in a discussion, very beautiful also that we, we had the last evening with Marius and with other two uh, Roma historians, they explained very well uh, how, uh, what was the impact, the social economic impact of the slavery on the Roma population. And today when, when we try to, to explain our social, cultural uh, situation, we 
we don't look to, to the slavery. And I'm sure that this is the, 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 the main element, the main factor that can explain also the, the distance between uh, Romanians and uh, Roma population, because uh, from the slavery started the, the, the program of the Roma assimilation and also cultural assimilation. So uh, from what I saw on the, also on the field, uh, for example, I, uh, when I started to present my, uh, my uh, methodology uh, uh, research uh, in, the, in the front of my PhD commission, uh, they asked me, but what do you will find uh, on the field after more than uh, 150 years after this event? So I said, I think that I, I will find something. And I found very interesting uh, uh, things in the Roma communities where we can find today mnemonics that are making direct reference to the slavery. So uh, I, I want to share my screen with you, if it is OK now, to present, to present some. So uh, this uh, was part of an ex exhibition that I uh, uh, realized last year on the uh, oral maps of the of the Roma slavery in Romania. So uh, here we have uh, a little church, uh, but what it's important is that it was a uh, builded very near to monastery, monastery Bistrița. And this monastery uh, had along of the, of the time, a very important number of Roma slaves. So this little uh, uh, church was established especially for the Roma slaves of the monastery. The distance between the monastery and uh, this church, it's like, a half kilometer, I would say. What is interesting for us uh, today? Uh, also, the the cemetery that you can see, uh, it is labeled in the collective mental in this in that uh, village that it's like the cemetery of the gypsies. Uh, if uh, when when I was walking to 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 this place, I met two uh, old uh, Roma women, and one uh, of them told me that her sister died in a village like three kilometers distance from this village Bistrița, and all the. Romanians from that village asked to be uh, uh, buried uh, here in uh, in Bistrița because also today in the collective mental this is the 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 place uh, destined for uh, for uh, for the Roma. So in a discussion with Petre Petkuts, uh, a Roma historian, he was saying. Uh, Nico, we, we must do their uh, archaeological research because I'm sure that we will find uh, something, uh, 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 some artifacts from the, from the Roma slaves. Um, this is not the only case. Here, it's another situation. Here, it's the monastery Horezu. It's a very well-known uh, monastery in uh, um, Romania, and also the number of slaves that had uh, along of the time, it was very uh, high. And here 
it's the the monastery uh, down and the this little church it's very very near it, it's in the left side uh, of the entrance in the monastery so we have another confirmation of the fact that the slaves were separated by the 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 uh, majority population um, and also what it's interesting to to mention it's that the name of the of the first church was Tigania, but uh, now the name was changed in Biserica Anasteri Maici Dom. Okay. Uh, here also uh, in uh, in here in Horezu, it was very hard to find even that the people that I uh, interviewed, Romanians, uh, they, they said, but I know, I know the, the, the Romas that are still living now here, but I, I don't think that it's good to send you to speak with them because it will be a problem because they don't want to, to be labeled as gypsies, you know? if you will go to, to speak with them. Uh, other situations, because we were speaking about the fact that Roma were slave of the monasteries, of the boyars. Here we, we have, uh, we have uh, another case, interesting. Uh, it's a village uh, with the name Tsiganesht. Yeah, so it's like the gypsy village uh, also being interested in this uh, idea of uh, mnemonics i visited this uh, this village uh, here it's uh, the the boyar court and the the, the domain but uh, it's no one still living uh, here, it's uh, abandoned. And in, uh, here in the center, it's uh, the Logofot Kostake Konaki and his father was a very important owner of Roma slaves. Uh, even that we have here these uh, mnemonics, like the name of the village, and uh, the, the statue of uh, Kostake Konaki in the center of the village, the Roma from here, they don't know nothing about Roma slavery because I return to the main question, what the Roma know about. Uh, uh, they don't know nothing about Roma slavery, but what is very interesting is the fact that they, they know, they have, uh, um, uh, informations in the collective uh, uh, memory about the daughter of Kostake Konaki. They were they uh, they remembering uh, her name and so on, but nothing about the the fact that uh, they were slaves. What I want to underline, because also I visited this mana that was the place where the Roma were uh, attested for. Uh, in, in the documents for the first for the first time, uh, in Tismana the Roma uh, were aware, were conscient by by the fact that they were slaves of the of the monastery, and uh, in a discussion with a, a old um, Roma lady, she anticipated my question and she said. Oh, do you want to ask if uh, the slavery had consequences uh, in our uh, community? And I said, yes. And uh, what it was very, very interesting, oh, just a moment, because I want to share with you something after that. It's important. Because that lady also wrote a monography of Tismana, of the Roma from Tismana. So she said, 
Do you want to know if the slavery had consequences? No? Yes. Okay, I will tell you. Uh, you must know that even today in the church, in the monastery, this manna, we stay separated. The Roma are in a part and the Romanians are in a part. And she said, but you know something, uh, it's, it's not something like we, we feel uh, discriminatory. It's, it's something normal for us. I mean, this is the situation for, in fact, for centuries it, it was. But, and also in this mana, the, they, they were uh, running to not be la labeled with the name gypsies or Roma. No, we are like the, the first argument that they were uh, uh, bringing to me. It was, you know, we were, uh, uh, we were slave of the monastery. And after that, Alexandrian Cusa gave us land. And we are like good Romanians. We are like this, we are on the same level with Romanians. So it's very interesting because I remember some parts uh, from the, the conference that uh, we had last evening with Marius, with uh, Pet uh, Petre Petkuts and uh, Bogdan Kiriak uh, regarding the measures that were taken after the abolition of, of the slavery. Uh, the, in the documents, the, the Roma, are uh, named like uh, uh, emancipated people, like emancipated. And uh, also uh, Bogdan Kiriak presented and Marius and uh, there are some uh, uh, journalists that are saying the new Romanians. So the impact that the, the slavery had on our identity, it was indeed very, very powerful. Uh, what we, we should do us today, it's to unbox this, uh, this uh, 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 history that was, you know, uh, uh, teached the, along the, the time. Also, I want to speak a little bit about this, uh, this is uh, like, like uh, I, Adrian, I'm yeah. sorry to interrupt you. This is an amazing presentation and I think all the documentation yeah. is valuable. Um, is there any way you can just, you know, go through the slides and um, uh, so we can we can uh, leave some time for questions from the. Audience. I will finish in in one minute. Okay. Uh, <laughs> also, uh, I think that the the work that it's uh, undertaken by uh, Alina and I, I think it's very important what what she mentioned that she received that email. Don't use that word because also regarding the memory, it's very important. And uh, here we, we have this ticket that was uh, uh, given to the, to the slaves uh, in uh, 1848. And we use this ticket like a very important uh, uh, mnemonic. But also behind this ticket, it's another st uh, story in the fact that uh, the, the revolution from 1848 wasn't successfully. And the, the Roma slaves that were, uh, uh, that received this ticket of liberation, after that, they were re-enslaved. So it's also, I, I, I want to underline the fact in which today we, the Roma, we try to give a, a new understanding and to label the, the history in order to, to understand better our identity. Thank you and sorry being thank so you. long. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, is it possible to, to end? Okay, great. Um, thank you so much, that's so powerful. One, one thing I would like to quickly mention that I'm, you know, I'm going to leave from this incredible 
uh, conversation with the understanding that it's imperative for us as Romanians to realize that the daily Roma experience is very different than the non-Roma experience. And with that, I would like to ask Magda to close with um, a few words of telling us what forms of reparations are needed. It's clearly that we need that. So if you can summarize, I would, you know, I would be grateful to let everybody know, if you can let everybody know <laughs> what we can do, what kind of reparation is needed. Yeah, so many of you may know that the topic of reparations has been uh, a uh, relevant and important uh, conversation in various parts of the world. Uh, we are talking in the United States about reparations for uh, for the slavery, uh, enslavement of Black Americans. We are talking uh, in the former colonies about enslavement. And I think that part of the work that I do at Harvard together with Jack Baba is really to connect the experience of Roma with these other global conversations so that we aim together for more coherent and more coordinated conversations on what reparations should look like. And in a volume that is called Time for Reparations and will be issued in, in a month or so, we look at uh, reparations from various perspectives. So in the case of Roma enslavement uh, per se, what we suggest in our work are four, uh, or rather five forms of reparations. One of them is truth telling, the other one is memorialization and memorialization of resistance. The third one is apology, which may seem simple, but the Romanian um, institutions and the Romanian church, but also the beneficiaries of the Roma enslavement have not apologized yet, none of them. But we also talk about compensations and uh, some sorts of uh, reform, anti-racist reforms at the political, cultural, and level. What I want to underline is the fact that when the enslavement ended uh, with the final act of abolition in uh, 1856, about 250,000 Roma or more, the, the number is not really clear, uh, were freed, but they didn't receive any property, any compensations, any support. At the same time, similar to the experiences of other peoples in other um, systems of uh, enslavement, the owners, the so-called owners, and by that I mean the enslavers, they received financial compensations in return for, uh, for freeing the, the, the slaves. So that, that's an important element in, in, in this conversation and it's as true in Romania as it's true in, in other parts of the world. So financial compensations are a big portion of this conversation, but in order to get to that point, we need to reestablish the National Commission to study the legacy of enslavement. We had one in 2007, which was uh, uh, put together by the government together with some Roma historians, but it, uh, the commission died like months after. So we need to reestablish that commission to write a report about the legacy of enslavement and then suggest all these forms of reparations. Truth telling is mandatory in this conversation. As you said, Roma don't know about uh, their history of enslavement. Romanians uh, don't know or refuse to know about this um, uh, about this uh, reality. But we all were, uh, we all carry the waters of our ancestors, as Professor Haifis would say. So I think it's important for all of us, first of all, to to face the truth, and second of all, to to heal. Um, and to create spaces for, for uh, reconciliation and healing, spaces that are for both Roma and uh, majority uh, Romanians. Thank you so much. Um, I really hope that this conversation will continue um, at some other time in the future, but I would like now to ask uh, Andrea if she has any uh, summary, I would imagine there are many questions from the audience and um, if we can hear some of them and give them some answer that answers that would be great. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, I don't know how much time do you have because uh, there are so many questions and so many comments and uh, I appreciate both the panelists, but also the participants who even had a lovely debate here on uh, one of uh, uh, your questions. Um, so I will um, 
uh, phrase them as, as they came. And I don't know how much time you have. Uh, I don't know how much time the panelists have, but I will just start with the, I think that was the first one. Um, some of the questions are personal questions because there are Roma participants here and they have personal questions and it's part of the, uh, of the healing, um, you know, uh, way of this uh, debate as well. Uh, so one of our participants is asking, when we do ancestry tracing with Tony and me, how does Roma ancestry present? I don't know if one of you can answer that. Uh, that's a long conversation, but personally, I don't believe in, uh, you know, DNA and ancestry.com as a route to, to uh, live to, to an experience and to be part of, uh, of a people. I think that lived experiences, cultures and uh, history and other aspects would, you know, help you understand your roots much more than uh, genetics, which uh, in itself, I think it's a very sensitive and unnecessary uh, item uh, in defining uh, peoples and identities. Yeah, uh, could I just say something, because I regret we need to go, but that's a very interesting question. I'll give you a very good example. Um, you, you may not be familiar with him, although he was quite popular in the States as well at some point as a big supporter of Donald Trump. Um, it's a very uh, interesting character we have here. His name is Piers Morgan, and he has a morning show here. Um, at some point, he did exactly this test. Uh, so he's, in a way, the epitome of the English person. Um, both in terms of what he says, but also the way he behaves. So he loves cricket, of course, and he, he loves smoked cigars and he, he drinks uh, uh, pints of beer. However, he did this test that you mentioned and it turned out he had absolutely no English blood in him at all. He was 17% Eastern European uh, and about 80% he was Celtic, um, you know, Welsh or uh, Irish. So you have someone who's so quintessentially English define culturally and linguistically, and of course, I suppose historically to some extent. However, <laughs> he was extremely surprised to find out that uh, according to the test he did, um, he didn't have any English heritage. So there you go. Um, that's probably one answer to that particular question. Thank you so much. So thank you very much. I, I should like to say good night and goodbye. Thank, thank you, Maurice. It was a pleasure to see you and learn from you again and um, thank you for supporting us in the work we do. Any time. Uh, another question is related to Alina's uh, powerful uh, film uh, and somebody says as a Roma woman I'm so grateful for your incredible work and thank you to the wonderful panelists and scholars for your scholarship and activism about our history and for this event today. And this is a question for Alina. How can we help make this a feature film? Not sure if Alina is still with us at this moment. Uh, I'm sorry, my uh, my signal is very bad. So um, the video is still, it's um, not really properly working. So I will just use um, a voice. Yes. Um, oh my God, yeah. There are, uh, now to put it blunt, I'm sorry not, for not being idealist and romantic for this uh, question, is that, yeah, uh, in order to make um, a production like this, obviously there is the involvement of what means uh, resources, resources, financial resources. So I'm not sure how, how uh, should I address this now. And I just have to say that um, uh, this has been, as I said, um, an impossible uh, dream that together with some uh, idealist people I, we achieved. This is not just my film, it's our film of the team. And um, we, we, keep, we could uh, keep the discussion and I just hope uh, someone who knows someone who knows someone who knows someone might be... Uh, so uh, idealist as me and say, yes, Alina, how much money do you need for making that film? Oh, sure. Let me grab some other friends <laughs> and let's make it happen. 
I'm sorry for being so cynical, but um, it, this is the realistic uh, um, yeah path I had to to take. I uh, I had uh, knocked at uh, Roma culture um, institutions for this uh, film, and I have not been su successful there either. But I have knocked at uh, supermarkets, at uh, places where people uh, have knocked for a film. And um, I, uh, I succeeded with uh, um, a creative hustle, <laughs> but only for a short. I would not achieve this by going to supermarkets, obviously. So uh, uh, nevertheless, I'm very grateful for everybody who, uh, who supported my, uh, my journey all these years. And I really have to mention Magda for uh, looking at me with empathy and, and giving me a chance back in 2009 when nobody really was believing in what I was doing and she did. So uh, I just have to say thank you for the question and that's it. And keep knocking. Keep knocking. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, yes. Yes. <laughs> Um, Thank you. If I may have a suggestion, if we don't have time to go over all the questions, can we put them in the comments on the video? Uh, and hopefully, you know, everybody who is here and has a Facebook account and follows Archer can answer some of the questions, maybe later or tomorrow, whenever you have time. And now, Possibly, I would say we have time for another two questions. Mm -hmm. There are three more, um, but let me just choose two more. Uh, somebody saying that, yes. Um, so I have learned from census and other official documents that my ancestors were slave owners. However, they would have been considered middle class farmers with usually no more than five slaves. Was this true in Romania or was slaveholding limited to boyards, monasteries as the state? I will try to give an answer, okay. Um, so um, in the collection with documents that we published, we have a very interesting case of a, a child uh, in two days, this uh, uh, child is sold between three masters. Uh, the last uh, owner that uh, buys this uh, uh, Roma uh, child gives the child, says the document, head for head for the uh, ransom from the... the um, social uh, uh, state of Romania, it was another uh, another uh, uh, social uh, uh, estate, but it was on another level than the, the slavery. So I want to say that there were particular persons that uh, could buy uh, slaves and the the ownership of the of the slaves uh, was uh, uh, not uh, uh, like a monopole only of the monasteries or, or the boyars or the the ruler no the particular persons could uh, have in property slaves thank you and uh... Uh, the last question uh, so far would be, um, how much was Roma slavery localized to the Romanian Principate versus some of the neighboring countries like Bulgaria, Serbia, Hungary? Uh, unfortunately, I, I cannot give a very uh, academic uh, answer on this issue because my uh, uh, First of all, I am not an historian, but uh, like also uh, Marius answered to this question in uh, in the chat, uh, the in the Romanian principalities it, it was very common situation to uh, have slaves, but in uh, in uh, that period 
like I also Viorela Kim speaks about uh, this in his book. Uh, there were it wasn't so spread like in uh, in Romania. Thank you. I just want to add the fact that, um, as Mihaela said, uh, the rest of the questions will add them to the chat on Facebook, and we are grateful for all the comments that we so the multitude of comments that we have on our uh, Facebook uh, uh, event. Uh, it looks like a very important discussion, and uh, thank you all for participating on and for the lovely uh, panelists and. Uh, and also somebody suggested to, and uh, is appreciating uh, to have a, uh, a list of, um, of readings available on uh, Roma from Romania and Eastern Europe generally, uh, and on the research. And uh, after the event, we'll ask the panelists to provide us with a list and we'll post it and we thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. You are, you, are, you know, uh, the most, um, resilient one, Adrian, you are here with us <laughs> till the end. Um, and that's because we ran, you know, a little bit over our time, which is a good thing. It seems that everybody enjoyed and participated. We had a lot of questions and comments in the chat. And um, uh, I'm so grateful that we were able to organize this event that it was urgent and imperative to have. Uh, thank you again everyone who participated. Um, I really appreciate Otilia's support. Um, everyone from um, United States who was present from Europe as well. And uh, we hope to see you again to future events. And we hope we'll address more urgent, important issues that um, we have to talk about. You know, it's, it's really, a need in this time of history to address issues, to be bold, to have the courage, the bravery, to speak about the um, unspoken and to give credit to everyone who um, went through hardship and um, you know, hear their stories. I think telling stories is what we really need at this moment in time. Uh, thank you, Otilia. Thank you, Adrian. Thank you, Andrea. Mm -hmm. Thank you, everyone, um, for being here with us today. And Otilia, if you want to add a few words at the end, feel free to do so. No, I just want to say that I'm very happy that um, Archer was formed. Um, I We feel like our work is completed in a way. We have been trying, goes with the Romanian Film Festival, to bring films that talk about social justice in Romania and how what we need to do through art and, you know, through academic research and uh, in terms of memory formation, because I do believe that as a people who went through a lot, we have, um, if we have, we suffer of collective amnesia and we cannot uh, live the present and make it better for all of us in diaspora or in Romania if we do not face our demons and talk about them. So I'm very, very happy to be part, to contribute a little bit to this movement and I will support your work and uh, Archer and Adrian and uh, Marius and Dalina and <laughs> Magda uh, with all the forces that we can. We, we are allies in this and I'm happy. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Goodbye, everybody. Have a wonderful rest of the day and weekend and uh, see you at the next event. Ciao. Bye.